start with hi everybody, my introduction I'm done, so I will go straight to my presentation. Um, nowadays, the reality is both physical and digital environment. So, corporations uh, that are able to take advantage of this new kind of reality find the greatest growth opportunities. But for corporations that are born in pre-digital age, it is very hard to abandon the waterfall production model. A workflow created to conceive, design, and implement products for physical environment. On the other hand, everyone agrees that a completely new approach is necessary. And most found inspiration in the Agile Manifesto to try and shape new models. Although this manifesto was initially written for software development phase of the product, Many companies are trying to extend its principle to the conception and design phases as well. Our company is among these, and our teams cover all the phases of the life of the product. In these teams, in the sections, are founder and welcome, and the coders and designers and marketing professionals sit together and share the same responsibility. We started this change in the way we were two years ago. It's not easy at all, I can say that, and uh, we are trying to face one difficulty at a time. Um, I share our experience so far and uh, a huge amount of lessons we learned. So, what are the cornerstones of this change? Is it possible to achieve uh, this change in a smooth way, or disruption is the only way, or the only chance we have? And which individual competences are needed? Um, the final question is, is this change worth it? Um, so, please, uh, let me do a very quick review of the main differences between wonderful and agile working methods. I know that you know them, but we need a common uh, set of uh, principles to, to share the rest of my presentation. So, <coughs> this is a classical waterfall working method. As you certainly know, the majority of work is done before the approval, and uh, stakeholders wait a lot of time for the first feedbacks, and any misunderstanding or change in the staffing requirements can indicate a huge consequence. Usually, professional works one after the other. And the handshaking phase is very long, we have to write a lot of documentation and deliverables and to do meetings at the end of any phase. And uh, in the agile process, professionals gather in the teams, they call us define the concept of a product or a service, um, and the heads of each of our departments gather a cross-functional team of professionals on the basis of the particular skills that are needed. Uh, the team breaks product development work into small increments iteration or sprints uh, are short uh, and, and so on. Um, this minimizes uh, overall risk and allows the product or the service to adapt to change quickly. Um, let's focus now on the cultural challenge that this method of work entails. And a short video will help us. It's a big movie that I, I hope you, you will see. It's uh, Escape for Victory. Uh, in this movie, there are some soccer players that are in a concentration camp in Nancy. Uh, and they try to escape during the, a match uh, that they engage with the, with the Nazis. And uh, they are not well fitted, they are tired, of course, so they have to manage how to win that match against people that is in, in health. So, let's see. Works in our favor, which means that as they do, good. Uh, 
funny, but sorry, Mr. Pelé. Uh, in a company that had to deal with such a complex physical and digital environment, no one can cross the entire field, in my opinion, and in my experience. And um, no one can be a champion in all the positions of the field. In a healthy company, everyone should be a champion in her or his field. Um, in its higher of expertise. Uh, therefore, in this environment, the real problem is how to collaborate in the best way. To face this problem, a cultural change is needed, as well as a change in individual competences. So, let's see together the cultural challenges that we found in our path. So, there are no products or services that a single individual can deliver better than a team. This belief is is perhaps uh, easy to embrace, but can, I can assure you it's hard to defend when things are not going as well as they were supposed to go. Um, if an individual is not working at his best, the problem should be solved by the team. If a member can solve the task, the team should take on responsibility on that. Uh, continuous improvement is something that concerns individual skills, the working method itself, the company as a whole. Uh, it's an endless process that is based on the principle that only what is repeatable is improvable. Um, that, that is one of the main keys that we found. So, um, if you if you have to repeat something, there's no place for magic, for secret formulas. Transparency <coughs> of each member in the team's regard is, is the key. Bottlenecks. Bottlenecks uh, happen, of course, but usually everyone has a different opinion on where they are and even what to consider a bottleneck. So, defining, finding and resolving bottlenecks is a team's duty. Uh, time must be boxed, of course, both, of, uh, both for individual time and the team time. Um, only what is boxed that is miserable and valuable. That is why time should be boxed. Um, so, uh, failures. Including failures in the process uh, can be hard, of course. Uh, I think it is the hardest cultural challenge, but we must remember that the design culture is like nurturing. Uh, it doesn't encourage failure. I have two kids, I, that's, I don't want to encourage them to fail, to fail, of course, but the iterative nature of the design process recognizes that it's rare to get things right the first time. This is a cultural change because all of us tend to take failures personally. It's not an action, it's me. So, we are all afraid that the judgment of one of our actions will end to be a judgment on us. Embracing failures in the process is the only way we have to transform them in opportunity to improve. So, as everybody knows, in any phase, of the Ijad set process, we can go back. So, from the test phase to the prototype phase, from the prototype phase, even the very beginning. And yes, it happens that we made a mistake in all the spring. So, yes, even in this case, uh, if it's better wasting just a week to fix a problem than finding it at the end of a long, wonderful process. We are finding out for ourselves how much this way of working strains some specific individual competencies. Here we are. First of all, the ability to communicate in a very concise and clear way. So it is not easy. When you work in a wonderful shape, you are not forced to communicate very much. You just deliver the delivery at the end of your work. In a team, you should be able to communicate in a different way. For this reason, in our office, it's easy to see around people rushing up on their notes before team uh, meetings. 
Then the autonomy of a team lies on the competences of its member. Therefore, any member should be able to find solution independently in this particular field. Collaborating means listening, uh, being able to change point of view when it's needed, abandoning jargon. I, I will be back on this point. Uh, Emphasizing, being on time, a lot of difficult, soft skills. But it doesn't suffice. In order to work in a team, every member must have a decent level of understanding of his colleagues' topics. We often see that deep technical skills in a single topic are useless if they don't match with the capability to consider things more widely. <coughs> in last year, we took some action for improving horizontal skills. For example, we organized the seminars on team working techniques, some conferences on our technical standard, and a UX design course open to all the office workers. Um, it's also important the ability to work without having the whole picture. Unfortunately, it happens and that a team has to improvise. This irritates a lot of people. Positivity. Positivity is transmittable, but we should remember that negativity is a really contagious disease. So, every member should be, should be, to feel responsible for the morale of the team. Curiosity is a lot, man. It's a constant desire to learn and improve. One of the biggest challenges for me as a manager is how to nurture this quality in the people that work with me. Every day. Every single day, despite fear of failures. So, is it possible to a company, for a company to embrace all these in a smooth way? When I did my SPAM certificate, my teacher was persuaded that the company can only change by disruption. Because the, all the company, all the, the employee, employees must embrace the new working method at once. Uh, such a disruptive change was impossible for us. Uh, too many stakeholders to convince, too many processes to change, a real danger to mess up everything. In addition, the more we forced ourselves to thinking that our only choice was between perfect agile or nothing, the more we realized that perfect agile doesn't exist at all. A pure agile does not exist. Agile is above all a way of thinking. And we are convinced that the core of the agile way of thinking lies in the way we consider responsibilities and duties. So, we realize that the more the individual are forced to follow the rules they didn't choose, the more they feel to be part of a kind of mechanism rather than a community. This means that they consider that they, an intangible system is in charge of the general outcome and they don't feel personally responsible for any possible failure. But the more the individuals are free to make agreements, as we are here, the more they feel a personal responsibility. If people participate in defining common rules, the environment where they work is not considered as a system anymore, it's their community. Outcomes are now seen as communities' achievements. On this basis, we decided to bet on the possibility of a smooth transition from the left side of this slide step by step, to the right side of this slide, one group of people at a time. Results are proving us right so far, luckily. Um, so, what we really mean for a team? A team is not a group. Why? Because a team has shared goals, a shared method of work, and every member has a clear role. So, let's see how our team are composed and how they work. Usually the team consists of six or seven people at most and they correspond to the competences that are needed in one of our digital projects. 
The assumption is, as we said before, that the team must have the least number of dependency or from other groups. In our company, every team usually has a product marketing manager, a project manager, a marketing manager, a project manager, an information architect or user experience designer, a graphic designer, a developer, and uh, given that we are in an editorial group, an editor or a journalist. Of course, this list can change depending on the situation. It always is possible for a team to request consultations on specific matters or ask some colleagues to come along for a period of time. Um, there are stakeholders in the team. Uh, teams are stakeholders, privileged uh, speakers. Each member is a clear in the team. Is measure a, a clear mandate from head or his chief. It means that as a member, I have to know what decision I can take by myself and when I have to ask my boss. Each member gives regular reports on her or his chief. The team assumes that each member does it. In other words, if the heads of departments ignore something about the project, they can blame the team for that. Each member has the last word on her or his area of expertise. It means that everyone in the team can, for example, point out or criticize something about the graphic, but the graphic design designer has the last word. Um, each member is individually accountable to the team, but the team is accountable to the stakeholders as a whole. If, for instance, there is a bug in the code, all the members of the, of the team consider themselves accountable for that. It diverts from uh, most of the other agile methods because in our company we decided to consider the whole team as the owner of the product as long as the team exists. It's a bet. It's, it's a very different thing, but it is working. So the team as a whole sits in front of the stakeholders in regular meetings after each stream. All members are first among equals. No one is in charge of the team. No one is the leader of the team. All members should be encouraged to approach on other member territories. And now, I will share the core of my presentation that is our little secret. The one that allows very different professionals to work together in a team. Um, in the teams, members talk about functions. Functions are the common good of a team. To see in more detail why function plays such a critical role, let's first consider that language is our design infrastructure. And uh, this is critical when a team is composed with such different professionals. And when the teams have has to, to start from the very beginning of the conceiving of it to the delivery of that. So, um, Jeff Goebbels says that the most important tenet of Lean UX is the minimum viable conversation. I think that those minimum viable conversations are actually functions. So, in mathematics, a function was originally the idealization of how Varying quantity depends on another quantity. In user experience design, I see a function as a relation that describes how a particular solution depends on one particular need. For example, Mary, actually Mary, Mary is thirsty. This is her need. I can design a system that gives her that's a function, a glass of water, uh, and this is the solution. Mm. But if I don't have glasses nor water, I can design a system that gives her a can of iced tea. That, that is a different solution, for example. And uh, maybe the system change because the system should be able to open the can, I don't know, to bring it in a different way. Uh, it's different from glass. Uh, 
And, um, but I have also the possibility to change the system's main function. For example, I can design a system that indicates that the nearest drinking fountain it's cheaper, maybe. And that's an app. Um, when we design through function in teams, we use uh, regulate, regulated sentences that, by at large, follow this rule. The subject of the sentence is not the system, and we force ourselves to think that the subject should be, in any sentence, the system. The verb is the specific action that the system has to perform. It is the core of the function. The object is the specific solution that the system has to provide. Indirect objects are usually the specific persona to whom the system addresses its action. Time and place complements are elements of what we usually call scenarios. When you design through function, the very first step is defining the main function that the system has. It's a function that describes the reason why it exists. Let's see some examples. Uh, La Repubblica, Repubblica.it, is a website that lets Italian-speaking people be informed on the latest news on their connected device. As you can see, I use the different corridors to, to show how the, the function is working in the sentence. Red is a progressive web app, and that's the solution. Uh, that lets Italian speaking people, that's the persona, understand the re that's the need, the reason and the consequences of current events on their connected device. So if the team agrees on a sentence like that, they are agreed also on what the product should not be. And that is even more important than defining what the product is. <coughs> because it helps the team to be focused on, on, on the goal. Um, after defining the main function, the team starts defining the primary functions that derive uh, from this. For this job, I always suggest teams to consider two kinds of functions. Um, the functions that enable understanding, that I call narrative functions, and the one that enable the user to fulfill an action. Let's see one example of narrative function. The first box in the home page, in the scroll, for example, lets the think they want to be informed on the main news of the day. Someone can ask, what about well, the English speaking people? Our product is not for them at the moment. So that's excluded. That's, let's say, what is not this product. Uh, and it is important to define it at the very beginning. One example of structural function, for example, the icon, uh, I don't know which one, let user print the page. As you can see, the first action that is the user, the user. Okay? So, let's see the main steps of the teamwork. Define personas, scenario, needs, user stories through user research, of course. As we said, the team identifies the functions moving forward from the most generic to the most particular, then maps the functions on the user stories, defines chunks and builds the backlog, that is the main to-do list of the team, starts sprints, and the team does retrospective at the end of each sprint, as well as a final retrospective at the end of each project. Two years ago, in waterfall process. Um, but some deliverables are strongly recommended. Uh, working agreements. You know uh, what are working agreements? Working agreements. Raise your hand. No one. And working agreements are a sheet of paper where the team define their rules. That is why setting rules is the foundation of a community. Is the foundation of a change in the way you consider your responsibility. For example, we gather every morning at night. We do this. We talk one people at a time. Um, we decide all together 
uh, which deliver what we want to do for any screen. Any, uh, I can, I cannot say uh, the perfect working agreement sheet of paper because any teams can can change the working agreements if, if they think that if they should. Um, okay. Uh, the backlog, in our case, is mostly made of the main functions that the system has to perform, of course. The, the, the to-do list is what the system should perform, so that is your task to, to build it. Uh, that is an example of uh, the backlog. As you can see, we have codes uh, that allows us to, to track the, the tasks that are um, Inside of any point of the backlog, for example, uh, tagging uh, a big archive is a huge uh, backlog point, but it will be uh, chunked in a lot of small tasks. So we map the chunk and, and the tasks. We have nodes, and here it's the screen planning. We will do this in the first screen, uh, this in the second one. Priority. All the documents, all, all the deliverables are, are true deliverables, that's why they are in common. Because we work in common. Um, of course, there are minutes of the meetings, and that's a very important deliverable. They are stored in a common um, drive. Um, the child of needs and functions that are the object of the screen. That is an example. Who needs uh, something and what the system does for him or for her. This is another example, a true example of the system um, that we built last year to, to produce uh, sites on the fly. Um, prototypes are strongly recommended as well. They are the key of for being sure that every everyone means the same thing to for involving stakeholders, uh, for testing the uh, um, that's an example of it. Like we use Prodo.io. Uh, anybody knows it? Okay. Um, and then there is the functional specification document. That is a very classical one. So uh, I will go fast on it. Um, the project retrospective final report. It is important because it is sent. Uh, it is sent to all the department. Because it's the way that I, as, as a head of uh, graphic and the UX department, uh, as I, I know how things uh, went in a team. And next time I can gather different people, or I can make someone who had difficulties to grow. I can build uh, some a course for him, I can support him. Uh, so it's very important that the perspective uh, well done, I can see. Um, for this reason, um, uh, we uh, structure the way we, we do retrospective. Um, first, we are not five enough. The retrospective goal is to improve the way a team works, not to reproach someone. Uh, that's a very cultural different change. It's very difficult for people. Um, that's why we always recommend that members talk about action and facts or function uh, during retrospective, never about how another member of the team is as a person. And we suggest to avoid generalization, we always ask the members of the team to fill an anonymous survey first. Uh, we prepare that with the other head of the department. It's an anonymous survey on Google form, and then um, when everybody answered the survey, we print the results, and they are anonymous, and the team gather to discuss the results of the, of the survey. Um, for sure, there's a very long road ahead for us, so please don't hesitate to share your thoughts, your tips, and whatever you think, and uh, thank you very much.